Um, so, hi, my name is Devin Stewart. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to be kind of extending uh, Phil Freeman's talk um, on uh, higher order abstract syntax in Haskell, basically uh, describing and building um, a, a subset of a language based on the simply type lambda calculus. Um, uh, the, the reason that I wanted to give this talk was because I didn't understand Phil's talk. Um, and this actually ended up being a really nice introduction to actually kind of the fundamentals of, compu of computing. Um, so uh, if you do have any questions, this is, uh, as to, to echo Jake, um, please do ask them because this is intended to be uh, kind of at the pace that I discovered things in this. So um, please do ask questions. Um, so uh, the goals, uh, I, so I explore the simply typed lambda calculus, as we just said. Um, so writing programs in an embedded language in Haskell. Um, so we're, we're going to see this, um, but we're, we're keep an eye out for the distinction between um, like at, at what point you you recognize the language kind of deviating from uh, the host language. The host language being Haskell. Because um, that's that's kind of a big moment. Um, so, uh, and also well, one other note is that um, this uh, this file that I'm walking through is literate Haskell. Um, so this file itself is runnable. Um, the the repository um, is I mean it's kind of small at the top of the screen, but um, the uh, repository is here if you want it. Um, uh, so um, anyway, that, um, <clears throat> the, the file itself is runnable. Um, and uh, I encourage you to download it and, and check it out. Uh, try, try to run the, uh, the examples. It is fairly well documented. And if there is something that is questionable, uh, issues and pull requests are welcome. So I'll give you another couple of seconds to write that down. Cool. Sounds good. Um, so, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, uh, as so the the simply typed lambda calculus is the concept of uh, or is kind of the fundamentals of um, what it means to have a language that can represent computing. Um, so, being able to des to describe uh, functions, being able to describe um, the the interactions between types, even if you actually don't know what the types are yet, we don't have like we've got these these kind of meta things, these holes for types to go, but we don't have the types yet. Um, so the the core of what we have uh, in this language, and this is this is directly lifted from Phil Freeman's talk, um, is uh, we've got application, uh, right biased application, left biased application, and lambda. Um, so we, yeah, with, a, with an application, one of the application in instances takes a, um, a function in our type class, uh, uh, higher order abstract syntax, was. Um, so if we've got an f, an instance of this type class, and a function in that instance of a type class, a value in that type class, we can produce another value in that type class. Um, so. Um, Similarly, you can wrap a, uh, a Haskell function um, into, you can kind of lift this Haskell function into uh, a Hwas function. Um, uh, and you'll, you'll see that in a minute. So uh, actually, Question pretty much immediately. Yes, sir? On that lamb, I think of it as lambda, and then the left side, is, is that the name of the function right there? Is, is that so um, the question is, um, uh, is the left-hand side the name of the function? Um, it's, so this, this uh, expression does not currently have um, user-definable names. Um, as you'll see, it, it does support value binding, um, but it, it kind of it piggybacks on top of, uh, on top of Haskell's bindings. Um, so um, all of the all of the functions that we're going to be defining are actually going to be in line. Um, and the first instance of this, or the first implementation of this language, actually generates Haskell source code. So you can actually see the, um, you can see what 
uh, gets compiled and, and the names are all kind of sequentially generated. So, so it names it itself. Um, yeah, basically, yeah. So it, it does actually. There's, there's. Um, I mean, well, I'll, I'll show you in, in like two minutes. Um, so, uh, so the, the in the simply type lambda calculus, we, as I as I mentioned, is we we don't have all these types yet. We just have the concept of of data transformations. Um, so we've got um, the identity function prefixed with H. Um, so we've got in our language, we've got a function from A to A. Um, and the way that we're going to des to describe this in in our Hwas implementation is by saying lambda. So we're going to pass in the 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 lambda here. And the lambda definition is from x. Give me x. Um, this is a normal Haskell function. Um, by by lifting it into this lambda um, by by passing it into this lambda function wrapper, um, we actually lift it into our Hwas language. Um, uh, because this is now a value, the result of this lambda expression application is a value in our language. The value is in our language, the function from A to A. Um, turns out we can actually apply that value to itself and get the same type back. So we can actually see immediately we have, um, we have higher, order fun uh, higher order functions in our language. Um, piggybacked on top of Haskell, uh, and then additionally just because of the way that uh, Haskell thinks about values. Um, so uh, function application, this is one also lifted from Phil Freeman. These, these are the two that are, that are from him, so um, mad props to, uh, to Phil. Um, and uh, so we've got this, this application. So given an A in our language, so this, this entire signature is in our language. So given an A and a function from A to B, give me a B. Um, so we can bind the value a, um, and then we can lift. Uh, we can lift the um, uh, the result of this thing. So we can actually we can bind a here, and we can return a function that does the application. So return a function that takes the function, and returns the application. So um, that's. Uh, actually the implementation of this. So uh, the only, I mean, it looks exactly like normal Haskell syntax other than um, these, these lambs in there and the, the double dollar for application. Um, const as well, uh, give me an A, give me a B, I'll give you the same A back. Um, so basically just eat the second application, the second parameter passed in. Um, function composition um, also, uh, <laughs> so give, give me a, a, a function from B to C, a function from A to B, and I'll give you a function from A to C. Um, it looks exactly like you would expect. Um, so um, these, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm running through these to, to get to the interesting part. If anybody has a question on these, I'm, I'm not kind of, I mean, it, it took me a while to kind of write these, so I, I don't expect you to not have questions, <laughs> but um, uh, I also, uh, I'm excited about what's coming up next. Um, so parameter flipping, actually, this one, this one was fun, so I'm going to step through this one. Um, so um, the, the function from A to B to C to B to A to C, um, I can bind the first parameter, or I can bind the function. Um, the function is what I just passed in. And then I can create um, a binding that binds X and Y, and then applies them in the opposite order. Um, so. Uh, uh, so um, I can, uh, based, on, based on this, now I have a function actually at this point. Um, once I have this lamb, I have a function from uh, x to y to something. And because I have this function f bound here, um, I, can, I can use that here because of the way that Haskell, um, I mean, we're, we're embedding this in Haskell, we're utilizing Haskell's own bindings to, to write our language. So we're bypassing a, a, a huge amount of work to make this language actually functional. Um, uh, functional in, in both senses, actually. Um, so we get, we get type checking for free, and we also get um, a, a significant uh, bootstrapping in, in our language for free. Um, 
So uh, defining church numerals, um, uh, if you're familiar with church numerals, uh, if you're not familiar with church numerals, they are um, the, the concept of counting um, without having types and the, the, the uh, counting is, is actually representative, uh, represented as successive applications of the successor function to a zero function. Uh, the typical implementation is zero is identity uh, and a successor function um, just calls, uh, it is called on identity. So you build up this uh, unapplied um, uh, sequence of function applications. Um, and then when you ask it for its value, it collapses down into um, the number that, it, that you asked it for, basically. So you can, you can provide the successor function as um, the integer plus one function. So, so um, given an integer, give me another integer that's one bigger. Um, so that's actually, that's what this is here. So we don't have types yet. Um, but the idea is that this is our successor, um, this is the previous value, and this would be the, the <coughs> resultant value. The important thing to note here is that zero has the exact same function signature, or the exact same signature, rather, the type, as one, as two. Like the, even though we're, we're applying successor to successor to zero, um, we are actually uh, getting the same function signature back because we, we have to. Um, and what we end up getting out of this is um, we get this, this unapplied sequence of, of successor calls on top of zero. Um, and then uh, in the future, in, in about maybe five to 10 minutes, we can go come back to this example and look at uh, what this looks like once we actually have types in the language. Um, so. Um, any questions on this, by the way, until I, uh, or I'll move on, anybody? No? Okay, cool. Yes? I, I find myself tied to names, but what this is is the substructure underneath that kind of thinking. Um, you can have to can you rephrase that as a question? <laughs> you have to go through pprint to make it, the names visible. Right. Um, so we're, we're now halfway on to that. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, go to the next thing. Um, but then yes, you're, you're right because we, this is, this is, so actually that's a good point. So this is um, everything above here where my mouse is. Um, everything above that is all um, nameless bindings with um, modeling data flow. Um, we don't actually have anything that's going to give us what we would consider to be the functionality of a, a, a common language like, like Haskell or like, um, like C or Python or whatever. We don't have, we don't have that yet. Um, what we have is this sort of uh, abstract modeling of computation. Um, and what we're about to do is uh, actually um, borrow uh, Freeman's uh, pprint um, type class here, or actually rather pprint instance of Hwas, um, that will print um, Haskell source code. So we can actually then look at the representation of what we were just constructing. So um, this is a type class, or this, this, this pprint thing goes uh, from an integer to a string. Um, the, it's in, it's um, its value, the value of a pprint um, value is a function that goes from an integer to the string representation of itself. Um, so the, the, the typical way that you're going to see this is um, uh, i being passed in. i is the, uh, as Phil put it, the name supplier. Um, and then what we do is we actually, we're passing i down into the, uh, the instances of pprint here. So we actually, we unwrap f, we unwrap g, um, and then we pass i down into those so that they can uh, kind of unwrap themselves. Um, and what we get back from them is a well-formed string of what they represent. And then we concatenate that with parens and an application symbol to uh, 
to suggest that, uh, or to, to get the source code that we want, actually. Um, because, because these are responsible for printing themselves, um, we don't actually have to do any sort of um, type checking or uh, other validation. We can trust these strings because Haskell provides that validation for us. Um, so kind of, kind of useful in this. It gets rid of a lot of boilerplate. Um, and uh, so the, the three that I've defined are um, right associative apply, left associative apply. The only difference is one of them uses dollar to force the right-hand side. Um, and lamb f uh, is the, the thing that actually constructs the lambda. And this actually is where the names come from. So this is the, the name supplier. Um, so we uh, give an nf in our language. Um, I want to uh, return a literal parentheses followed by a literal backslash concatenated with the, the result of this name supplying uh, function, and a, a Haskell arrow um, to denote lambda syntax, um, and then the result of applying um, this, uh, applying 2, 2f, um, actually, sorry, No, yeah. Wait, where's the? Sorry, got a little bit lost here. So, oh yeah. So this is so this this is an actual Haskell function. I completely forgot about that. So the this is a Haskell function from a um, from a, val a value in our language to another value in our language. But this is a Haskell function, not one of our uh, language functions. So if this were a language function, we would need to use apply. Um, but because this is a Haskell function, um, we, we pass the, the first value in just normally. So this, uh, normally for Haskell. So we actually do construct a new pprint instance, um, ignoring, the, ignoring the name supplier, because we're just going to use the, the name of our current level um, and then and pass that into F. So we're, we're creating the binding that goes into the next level. And then we're passing into that next level, we're passing the successor to our current, um, our current uh, number that we're using to generate names. So this is sort of abstract, so I'll show you a, an example of this. So if we, um, if we look at uh, what it means to actually pretty print some of the, the things that we've, uh, that we've defined so far. So we've got const app and then the identity function, the uh, identity applied to itself function. Um, so we've got, these are actually the direct outputs um, from uh, running these lines. So I can actually put this directly into the console and prove it to you. So this is, um, if I run this, what I'm going to get is um, this is actual, like, this is actually the Haskell that gets output. And what we end up with, if we look at it, um, is um, the, the type that we expect. So we give it, give it a T1, give it a, T, uh, give it a T, and then it'll give us back the T1. Um, the, this is the definition of const. This is a definition of const. Um, so um, because this const thing is actually a, it's defined in our, in our Hwas language. It doesn't actually have an implementation yet. It doesn't know where it's trying to go. It, it, it's just a representation of abstract comp uh, computation. It represents the function a to b to a. Um, but by running it through pretty print um, and giving it a name supplier, um, we, we can actually get it to um, transform itself into Haskell source code. Um, we'll see that this is actually, um, while useful for constructing um, a, a language that represents a subset of Haskell, or, or I'm, I, for people who are familiar with uh, chroot uh, in, in Unix and Linux, um, uh, being able to restrict the environment, restrict what you're, what you're describing or able to describe in your language. Um, if you write a, an environment in this Hua system, you actually can't represent 
parts of what Haskell can represent natively. You're, you're exposing only the part of the language that you actually want to expose. So um, just aside from the kind of philosophical, philosophical explanation or, or uh, adventure of what does a language actually mean, how does a DSL work, um, there's, there's actual application for this kind of right out the gate, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, the, that being said, it's still, I mean, we still don't have types, right? We're still just looking at A's and B's. So um, the, the next thing that I wanted to do is actually expose part of Haskell's type system into this Was uh, language. Um, so I ended up doing that via multi-param type classes, um, which allow you to um, parameterize a type class with multiple parameters, as it turns out. Um, so uh, the, the type class Hwas type F, F is one of our Hwases, and T is the type from Haskell that we want to, to represent. Um, this uh, actually does exactly this. It just takes a T and returns an F of T. Um, this is actually your pure from everything else. I mean, it, it works kind of like pure, um, except it's constrained by instances of Hwas type. So uh, if we provide an instance of Hwas type for bool, um, it just happens to be um, drop the name provider, show x, and that's the result of this thing. Um, it is show x because every instance of pprint goes from integer to, or from int rather, to a string. And because we're compiling to Haskell, we can use the shown version of bool. So that'll give us true and false correctly capitalized for Haskell's consumption. So if we look at, um, so run pretty uh, pure true, uh, h pure true, sorry. So run pretty h pure true, we get true back. Um, so kind of good. This is what I would expect. Um, and I mean, just th what the goal here was to be able to copy and paste and get the same value back. So and this kind of satisfies at least my goal. Um, so for, for larger things, this copy and paste ability actually becomes kind of relevant because we don't currently have a way to save our language out. Um, so, uh, or rather to reinterpret our language. So we would have to save the language out to a file and then run that um, source code. Um, so that's where that's where the, the ability to actually save it and then run it actually is, is pretty important. Um, so to go along with an instance of bool, um, we can actually create another type class to represent um, the, uh, the extensions or the, the language functions that utilize bool. Um, so if then else and uh, h and or hand, uh, depending on what kind of person you are. Um, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with uh, hand, uh, just because I'm that kind of person. So if we uh, run pretty um, hand uh, h pure false and h pure true, um, we should expect to get back um, an expression that looks like Haskell that would evaluate to um, the true and false um, without quotes with quotes because it's a string. So we see, we get quotes, um, but this is actually, if I copy and paste this, it's runnable code, and it results in the, in the result that we actually expect, right? So, um, but the important thing to note is that it is going to be a string because it's an instance of preprint. We're running, we're running this Hwas language um, in a thing, in an instance of the language that will generate code. Um, so, I'm sorry, question? No? Okay. Um, question. Yeah. So, we can't use any text in the language that, until we import it from Haskell, right? Yeah, so the, the question is, we can't use any types that we want. We, we have to specifically add support right. for them. We, we definitely do. Um, that's, that's what these instances are here. So, um, I've currently added an instance for bool. Um, we can see down here, um, uh, I, I added an instance for, for equality. Um, that's, I mean, yeah, we, uh, we don't want, what we, do, what we want to do is we want to restrict the, uh, the programs that can be expressed in our language. 
Um, we don't want people just writing their own data types and suddenly now your language has to support that too because that's where you get bugs and, and failure. Um, so yeah, good question. Um, so H not, um, we are explicitly typing this to say a language that can use H not must support the, the HWAS type uh, bool and also have a definition of HWAS bool ops uh, for that language. Um, so this is now a, a, a kind of a second interesting concept, which is um, the, the ability to express um, constraints on what languages can use functions, right? So we're representing functions as these values, and I can't, I can't actually compile this code unless I have a, an instance of the language that knows what bools are and how to work with them. So that's why the, 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 the type constraints have gotten a little bit kind of more specific here. We're not just talking about things that are HWAS anymore. We're not just saying, yeah, just give me, a, give me a HWAS F. Now we actually need to know that the language is actually going to support the things we care about. And this is another point where you can actually select exactly what features you want your, sub, your instance of this language to have. So this is... Um, uh, like a, a huge amount of power for a, for a language designer or an API designer. Um, so yeah, su super great. So that's basically our grammar? So the, uh, the question is, um, is this our grammar? And I, I'm not sure how to answer um, because my understanding is that we're using we're using Haskell syntax. We're representing the language in Haskell, so it has to type check in Haskell. But we've also we've also um, constrained the programs in our language as well. So we further applied constraints past what Haskell would give us. So I would say that Haskell is our grammar, um, if that's if that's a sane answer. Um, I I don't know. Yeah, but um, but. Uh, with additional constraints. Yeah. Seven. Um, the plus type f bool yeah. constraint, could that also be a constraint on as bool ops? Plus bool ops? Yeah, so uh, the question is um, could, we, could we refactor these to um, be easier to use? Um, I'm guessing that's, that's the question. Maybe. Well, that's how I interpreted the question. <laughs> um, uh, the, the question was could we combine these, I guess? Well, is it? Is it necessary to uh, have was type f bool? Ah, okay. Bool yeah. So this this um, uh, as it turns out, yes, <laughs> Be because we did not add that as a constraint here. The the question is, do we need both of them? Um, I could move this up here. Right. I could have done that, and I didn't. I'm sorry. Fine. Forgive me, please. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there, there are a couple of things that you'll see in here that, that are uh, um, warts like that, but uh, as, as far as things go, um, I was more focused on um, the, the expression of constraints. Um, so uh, yeah, there, there are refactors, and I, I will probably continue to, to make changes to this, but um, the answer is yes. Um, hmm? Yeah? Can you put a Haskell type in there? Can I put a Haskell type in where? Uh, right after the uh, type symbol, you know, so that you, you just import all the concepts of, say, a web page. Right. So the question is, can we import uh, any arbitrary Haskell structure? Um, uh, the answer is yes. Um, but what you would have to do at that point is provide an instance of WAS type that fully encompasses that type that you've imported. So when we added an, in, an instance of um, HWAS type for bool, I had to provide an instance of uh, pure that would handle all types in that type. So if you wanted to lift uh, a, an entire library into your language, it would be a significant amount of work to go and wrap every single one of those functions. But what you would have done at that point, and you'll see this in a, in a couple of minutes, is you will, you will need to provide an instance of every single, um, uh, every single mapping from your HWAS representation 
to your target language. So if you want to compile to Haskell, fine, easy, easy enough anyway. Uh, if you want to compile to JavaScript, as Phil did in his talk, if you want to compile to Python, if you want to compile to C, you're going to have to provide mappings for those things. And it becomes more difficult the more you kind of branch away from Haskell, um, especially if you're talking about a library that is in Haskell that isn't in another language. Um, so th you're, this, isn't, um, this isn't arbitrarily generating code for you. This is, providing an inter this is providing a structured interface that you can generate your own code, I guess, if that makes sense. But an application is create the bindings for XX language. Uh, so this the, would expose what's missing. Right. So the 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 um, the, the follow up was uh, an application is create the bindings for some language. Um, yeah. Um, at at that point, it stops becoming a restrictive language. I mean, this is a, a, a domain specific language because you're trying to represent something fundamentally different than what you can represent in Haskell. You can either go more restrictive, as we are here representing a subset of Haskell, or you can go less restrictive, potentially by adding dynamic values or mutable state or things like that, adding less safety and, and, um, and accepting those ramifications in your language. Um, there, are, there are design uh, uh, principles behind that that you may choose to do differently. Definitely possible. This is just kind of, this is the start of a journey. Not, I'm not saying this is the end of the, of the journey. This is, so to add that support, I think, would be an interesting thing, and I'd like to see it. I guess that's what I'd leave you with. And then I'm going to continue, so I'm not really leaving you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, now, that we've got H, uh, now, now that we've got this uh, was bool ops uh, with if, then, else, and and, um, we can implement not uh, in, a, in a convoluted way. But more importantly, we're implementing not not as an extension to our language, but as a normal function in our language. We, we can implement not without support, like native support for it in the language. So if we say, um, uh, sorry, I just cleared the screen. So if we say um, h not, we look at the type of this. This is a function from bool to bool. If we um, run pretty on h not, we see Put sterling. I can type. So if we look at this, this is actually kind of what we'd expect. So give me a bool. Um, so we don't have the type on this, but the type is actually here. So give me a bool. Um, if that bool is true, then false, else true. That looks like not to me. Um, what happens if I apply um, uh, h true or h pure true to that thing? Um, so now I've got an applied version of this thing. But notice that the application happens in the source code. I'm not actually reducing this. I'm not evaluating it. I'm just kind of saying, hey, here's another thing that I want to do once you've done the first thing. So if we run this, we should get false. Um, and if we run it with false, you get true. But the important thing is that what we've done is we've actually generated source code that evaluates to the value that we want in the target language, not in the host language. We're not actually doing all this work up front. Um, a point that, um, that might be interesting to make here, I think it's interesting, is that we are, we are actually, we're getting kind of close to being able to do some sort of analysis to, to look at the actual values. Like we've got, we can actually, we can we can almost do dependently typed programming in this. Like not not saying that dependently typed programming is like an easy thing by any stretch of the imagination, but we've got a language in Haskell, and we've got access to to data primitives. We've got access to the the actual values that are in the language, and we can start um, potentially uh, deriving some form of meaning from the data, the the actual kind of fixed points of data that are, that are being compiled into your language. This is, this is the next step off of, yeah, I've got a language that compiles, now what? Right? So it, we're, we're using Haskell's type system for free. And we've got, in our compiled source, we've got just these, these bits of, of code. So kind of food for thought. Think about, like, what if we could actually prove in the compiler 
that this must always evaluate to false because we know we can model the data flow and this can't be anything but false. Our optimizing compiler could actually just replace this entire, this entire structure with the value false and now suddenly we've uh, completely removed that, that computation that would have been required um, in, the, in the target language, what we're trying to compile to. So um, I think this is interesting. This is what keeps me up at night, by the way. Um, so uh, because I uh, like to uh, cheat when it gets me closer to my goal uh, for free, um, I actually just decided to import all of EQ. So <laughs> sorry, um, I, I basically, uh, I wanted to implement equality, but I didn't actually want to implement equality like for real. So I just said, you know, I, let's, let's just, Let's just trust that Haskell knows how to, how to t compare two A's and then it'll give us a bool. So um, the instance of equals uh, actually does just kind of concatenate the, the double equal and just kind of trust the host language to kind of do the right thing, please. Um, and uh, this only works because we're pre-printing to Haskell um, and uh, anything that we try to pass in that isn't an instance or doesn't have an instance of EQ will fail. Um, but this is, this is a wart. Just pointing this out, my apologies. Um, uh, but it's also kind of a good, uh, good uh, exercise, uh, just to, in my defense, it is a good exercise of um, exposing subsets or entire uh, subsets of the Haskell language into our, into our dynamic language, or into our, um, our domain specific language. So if we actually wanted to cheat and say, yeah, what we're actually getting out is something that knows how to be compared or, um, I, hey, trust me, I'm going to provide the bindings to do real equality elsewhere. Um, you don't need to worry about equality so long as uh, Haskell knows how to compare these things. These things are generally comparable. Um, that's uh, another, like, as a, as a language designer, you can include that as your, like, kind of supplemental library for your, for your code, like, in the environment that it's going to be running in. Um, was that, did that make sense? I see confused looks. Ben, you're right? Yeah, I was just wondering about, about uh, would, could you write a pretty printer that outputs the constraint? Ah, yeah. So the, the question is, um, could, we, uh, could we write a pretty printer that outputs the equality constraint somehow in here? Um, um, yeah. So the, the yeah, that's that is the problem. The problem is that the the type signature would have to come from somewhere external to the the line. Um, so without doing a lot of extra work, I don't think so. Um, so yeah, that's that's why it's that's why it's a work really. So sorry. Um, so uh, oh yeah. You could imagine writing a a version of a printing printer that just prints the type signature. It's true. And you could have a pretty printer that just prints yes. the expression. Yeah, write, yeah. Then write a pretty printer that runs the first one and the second one. So the point, the point is, and very well, uh, well put, is that because we actually know all the types up front, um, or at least we, we know some of the types up front, um, actually, we don't know all of the types up front. You have to add a, a thing to the type classes that, to the type type classes that lets you print the string representing the type. But what about A or B? Or C, have have like right? So now, now you're talking about type inference, like uh, the, at the language level, and that was the problem that I ran into for like a week. Um, so the the question was, um, could we provide another instance of the language that would print the type the type signature? And the answer, um, at least kind of uh, somewhat flippantly, uh, my apologies, uh, is no. Um, it's entirely possible that it is possible, and that I'm just not seeing it right now, um, but. Uh, uh, it's it's definitely an, an area for more research, not something that I can say, yeah, I could write that right now. Um, yeah? That suggests to me that instances of the language form a monoid. Right, because what Jay just said, you would run one and then the other, and what you get back is an instance of the language. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they are sort of composable. Yeah, so... Um, so apparently instances of this language, at least in some capacity, are monoids. Um, because, well, yeah, as it turns out, everything is a monoid. Um, uh, 
like that was the stuff Phil was tackling, like the, the algorithm W and unifying types, fresh variables for types, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, if you haven't watched Phil's talk, um, please go watch it because it's great. Um, this is definitely derivative work, um, but, but Phil's was much more in depth um, and potentially answers more questions than this does. Um, although I still think this is, I mean, it's fun, right? So um, anyway, so uh, adding an instance of was equal, e e ops um, does exactly what we just said, which is that it takes a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and returns a pretty printer that um, just does the uh, double equals on it and concatenates it. So that's cool, but oh man, lists, right? I'm excited. Um, lists, uh, kind of cool. Um, decided to implement them uh, via cons and nil, uh, and but we also have map. We have like an actual map function that goes from A to B uh, and a list of A's to a list of B's. So that's that's uh, actually pretty neat. Um, cons is pretty straightforward. Colon uh, nil is uh, empty empty list. Um, and map actually does use the uh, uses map. It doesn't use fmap because uh, we dac we are pretending that functor doesn't exist. So um, because map just works on lists, we can use it and uh, be happy with how about that. Um, and then concatenate as well. Um, so I want a car in the CDR. Um, so we're getting kind of close to that, right? Yeah. Um, so, so if you if you look at the output of some of this stuff, um, there's I, um, I I went a little bit beyond what what uh, Phil had done um, in, in the sense of uh, adding parentheses everywhere, um, and uh, so yeah, what ends up coming out looks a lot like Lisp. Um, so. Yeah, it's definitely um, uh, a, a good, good exercise, good addition. Uh, um, so let's see. Um, so ex1, right? So let's let's look at ex1. So uh, ex1 is uh, a a list of booleans. So if we um, uh, run pretty, what is it? It is uh, a, whoops, uh, put sterlin, uh, uh, put sterlin. So um, if we map h naught over this list, um, what we get back is kind of what we expect, what we should expect anyway, which is the opposite of what we put into it. So we get false true back, um, where we had previously put in true false. Um, so, and sure enough, that's here as well. So, um, writing a more complex program. So this is a program that takes a list of Booleans and a bool and returns a list of Booleans, but um, with the matches of the second parameter inverted. So um, as we iterate over array, uh, over R, um, and we, we look to see if um, to invert equals the value at uh, our current index in, in the list, or our current element in the list. Um, and then if these equal each other, if they are equal, um, then we invert the value. Otherwise, we just return the value. Um, some people might uh, notice that if you invert uh, every value that doesn't match a value in a list of Booleans, you will end up with a list of the same value. Um, you're correct. So uh, good for you. Um, we're going to do it anyway, because it's fun. So uh, ex2. Um, and so if we uh, put sterlin run pretty ex2, that doesn't work, because r's are hard. So um, we've got this thing, which is uh, my guess is, other than the backslash, is very similar to Lisp. Um, so if we run this, or rather if we look at the type of this thing, we see the type is actually what we expect, bool to bool to bool. Um, if we attempt to run it with uh, true, false, true, and match false, 
we see true, true, true. If we match true, we see false, false, false. Um, kind of neat as far as things go. Um, this, is, this is great to do in Haskell. This is really fun. But um, I want a little bit more than just that. Um, so let's do it in JavaScript. So this is the implementation of, uh, of, of WAS for JavaScript. Um, so I, I provide all the, all the implementations of the type classes. Uh, so HOS important for doing actual function application. Um, uh, list ops for dealing with lists. Um, bools for dealing with bools. And then exposing the types uh, string. Um, I don't know why that's in there. But you know, let's roll with it. Um, uh, so providing uh, prettyjs for bool as well. So um, we've got we've got bool, we've got bool ops, we've got list ops. We're 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 actually we're rocking here, I think. So if we replace our um, run pretty with run pretty js, we get nothing. <laughs> right, right. I know, I know what you're thinking. Hey, it's an error, but it's on purpose. It's documented. So um, this is because I did not actually implement ecops, right? So this is this ex2 is a valid, completely valid program here, but is not a valid program in our JavaScript printer because JavaScript doesn't have a definition for ecops because I left it commented out. So if we go um, to was ec ops for pretty js. We've got these two lines. We can turn those into code. Um, this is um, literate Haskell. So um, for the uninitiated, uh, putting the uh, greater thans before turns it into code that Haskell knows to think or to think about. So um, if we rerun this now, if we try to run this, we get actual valid JavaScript. Kind of neat. Um, if we take this and put it into the browser, right? <coughs> Everything needs to run in the browser. Um, so f, now we've got an f, right? Well, so undefined because that's how um, value assignment works in, in JavaScript. Um, so f for uh, true, false, true, um, and providing a true will give us false, 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 and false will give us true, true, true. Right? If we pass in, right, you ready? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We get true 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 because of, of JavaScript. Similarly, 0, false, 2, 3, 4, 5. So super great. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's see uh, undefined and an object. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted. This is the best. Oh, because it was true. Sorry. I no. I needed. I needed. I needed false. Oh, okay. It actually did it. And I thought that undefined would turn into to. Isn't uh, isn't undefined falsy? Is it just null that's falsy? Triple equals or double, double equals? I I might have used triple equals just on on impulse. I did use a, a double equals. It should have been fine. Anyway. Um, so good for JavaScript. JavaScript survived the the uh, relentless assault uh, on its on its integrity. Um, so yeah, sure enough, there we go. We provided the implementation, and it worked. Um, Hoss to Haskell evaluator. Now this was fun. Actually, can, can we go look at the equal thing? Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to understand uh, the, how the types thing works in this, because this this isn't just an implementation of Hoss ops for bool, right? This is what what could, would this work on? Right. So um, the the question is because this doesn't specifically constrain itself to bools, what other things could this type class work with? Is that the question? Yeah. That is the question. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, anything that is equable because of the the constraint of equals. So things that have structure in Haskell. And like an eek e instance, yes. kind of break down here, right? Things, th oh, totally. That was why I mentioned that before. Is that yeah. uh, things, things that have an eek instance in Haskell? I definitely cheated by using eek yeah. because I'm not actually representing a quality at all. I'm just trusting that the language knows what equality means. Turns out this isn't a reasonable assumption to make when you're compiling <laughs> other languages. 
Um, uh, for instance, I have a, a Python compiler, and it doesn't know how to compare lists mm. at all. It's just like, oh, oh sorry, the, the, the JavaScript one doesn't. Yeah. Um, and, and the Python one can compare lists, which is good, I think. Actually, maybe not. Now I'm, now I'm confused. So let's, let's look at it. Um, but, um, but yeah, Eek was the, because we were working yeah. with Haskell and it made sense. Yeah. But Eek was the wart. Yeah. Right. E Eek was definitely the wart. So good on you. So the fix for that would be to, to make the, the Haskell instance of it generate the Eek yeah. Yeah. restriction, which was difficult. Well, <laughs> I, either that or, um, so we, uh, you could write something that would, so the question was, um, could you write something that would generate the Eek instance for the types that you're using? Um, the, the other, uh, the alternative approach would be to write something that would be like Hwas types, um, but that would be like Hwas eek type and then multi-parameter types, and then you would actually define the bindings for each type that you want to be able to eek. And then in Haskell, for Haskell, you would do a type class that constrained on eek and does all Yeah, that. It, exactly, yeah. Maybe uh, generate templates with the or something. Yeah, I mean, there's like loads of, I mean, it's metaprogramming up the wazoo. This is great. So. Um, uh, that being said, I, I got tired of all this copying and pasting stuff. So um, I wanted to actually evaluate the stuff that I was typing into this, this language. So um, writing a language that would represent, um, this, is, this is just for fun. This is um, the deriving show allows us to, to kind of pretty print the actual values. Um, but it kind of breaks down and also limits the things that can be uh, added as types to your language. So this would probably be the first thing to go, just as, as kind of like pointing this out um, in hindsight. Um, but um, so an instance of was for eval um, is actually just doing the eval and returning the, the, the A. So um, the, the result of the value is actually the value in eval. It's not actually trying to do anything special. It, it is as you're, as you're evaluating stuff, it is actually computing. Um, so neat. Um, uh, instance of list ops uh, does concatenation. It actually basically just takes all the stuff from up at the top and then removes all the quotes. Because um, this is pretty much exactly uh, what I did to get this. Um, pure for bool is just hevel. Um, equals is uh, just double equals. And uh, yeah, so we can actually look and see what this looks like when we actually try to, um, what is it, run H eval uh, for uh, ex2. The, so the type of this should be bool to bool to bool. Yeah. So um, if we uh, provide true, false, true, and true, we see false, false, false. So yeah, we we're 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 pretty solid here. This is actually like I, I think just not to. Uh, break my arm, patting myself on the back, but I mean this is this is uh, pretty pretty functional as a library goes. So uh, everybody should go and clone it and, and open pull requests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Python, this is one I'll leave you. I'll, I'll leave you with this one. So this is this is a, an instance for Python. Um, so if you uh, run, um, <coughs> so pretty Python uh, x2 will. Uh, nope. What did it do? By the way, isn't pretty JavaScript an oxymoron? Womp womp. Um, oh, run pretty Python because that. Yeah. So, um, so pretty Python uh, gives us runnable Python using <laughs> wonderful lambdas. So Python and paste. Uh, so. Let's pull that out of the ether. And then, uh, so true, full, huh? Oh, yeah. And then for true, false, 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 hooray. So we've got like a, quite a few output languages here. This is pretty good. Um, so, yay, more types. So adding uh, integers, um, uh, totally doable. Uh, adding, um, uh, Oh, sorry. Adding adding uh, num or adding integers and uh, overall nums. Uh, this is this is another wart. This is another wart um, uh, because of this num here. Um, 
it means that other types could creep in, but I was kind of being uh, adventurous and, and thinking that I would add more uh, numerical types when I kept it to int. So um, that's definitely something that could be added there, but this is another thing to watch out for if you're looking at this. Uh, num is, is definitely uh, way too broad for what currently exists in there. Um, fortunately, there's no way to pure other num instances into the language, um, so we're kind of safe just because you can't actually get other numbers in there. But if you exposed even one value or one function that uh, was a primitive that kind of bypassed the type system and allowed um, uh, int, int division that, um, uh, that produced a, a, a float or something, um, you'd, you'd be in a world of hurt. Um, so uh, adding the, basically adding numbers to all these different uh, languages that we've got and uh, adding strings and yeah, I've got a bunch of example expressions that we can kind of mess around with. Um, actually, one thing that I would like to return to if we've got time, do we have time? We're good? Okay, cool. Um, uh, I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning of time um, to the church numerals. So uh, church numerals needed um, now to, to look at this now with our, with our uh, lots of knowledge about how this, this language thing works. Uh, church numerals needed a successor function uh, and a starting value and would produce counting. It would be, allow you to do kind of uh, going forward arithmetic. Um, so if we uh, attempt to do that. So if we look at the type of uh, h2, um, we need to provide a successor function, um, a zero, a starting number, and we will get back some of the numbers. So let's cheat and use run uh, heval. So the type of this is now that. So we're, what, uh, I'm, I'm not cheating, but I'm not going to actually run that result. I'm going to um, use that to to type check that this actually will work. So if we provide um, an instance of add, now that we've got, I'm going to jump back down to the bottom, um, we've got numbers now. So because we've got numbers, we've got an add. We've got this, uh, this hwas n, hwas n to a hwas n. Um, so if we provide um, uh, add h pure, uh, 0 and h pure 1, um, what we should get back is uh, an n. So that actually works. Um, if we uh, lamb, then this won't apply anymore because of, um, because of the restrictions of the types. But I think we can actually use app. No, we can't. Um, sorry, this is, where was it? It was. Well, I mean, we can we can write it. So if we um, if we say lamb um, x to lamb uh, y produces add x y, so we can actually store that as um, h add, and the type of h add is exactly what we want. This is in in the functor. This is actually in the not the functor. It's in the language. Um, whereas this is in the, the, the call space of Haskell, this is in the call space of our language. So we've, we've wrapped the entire function, we've lifted the entire function with application into our language. So if we apply to hadd, if we apply um, hpure1, um, now we should get a function from a to a, which satisfies what we're looking for for h0. Right? So we need an A to A, and then an A and an A. So if we actually take this um, h inc, right? now we've got an inc function. Um, and if we apply that to um, uh, h0, now we've got uh, A to A. If we apply uh, h pure 0, we, sh we should just get an A. And now if we run that, um, if we run this thing, we should get, my, my suspicions will get zero. Nope, we get that. Um, because, let's see, 
Uh, the variable a0 is ambiguous. Um, let's try to pretty print it and see if that works. Nope. Oh, because um, h inc is, is uh, ambiguous, because it was unbound. There are multiple bindings for that thing. So let's actually let's provide the, the actual instant, uh, instance of this thing. So h add. Um, with h pure one and let's see if that works. Nope. Well, does anybody see the uh, see the, the error that I'm miss or that I'm uh, causing here? I've, my suspicion is it's actually coming from this. Um, lamb x lamb uh, add x y. And so that um, applied with that should be nope. You just have to stick a tag on it to say which kind of pretty print one. No, because pretty print is only there's only one thing that, that works with that. Um, but the, the question is this H pure one, H pure being an issue, right? So H pure should Can you pretty print just H pure one? Uh, yeah, sure. Ooh. Uh, instance, oh, instance. So that's, I think that was it actually. I think so. That's strange because this actually worked earlier. Um, so if we're, if we constrain that, so if this, if we turn this to int and int and int. Well, I mean, I didn't. <laughs> Um, and then let's also just from a. Also just put h pure zero has type int. H pure zero has type int like in in the thing. In here, thing this thing. Um, the problem is, uh, oh, actually, so the one would have int. Okay, so one and yeah, that would probably work. No, that's that's totally reasonable. Uh, and that's because of these, right? Ta da! Well done. Good, good job, everybody. Right? Um, and so what we've got now is we've got zero. Super cool. Um, so if we run uh, h run h eval, um, take the zero out, and now we've got zero. Cool. Um, what about if we apply that to H1? Uh, we get 1. H2, we get 2. But if we provide, um, or if we apply, rather, um, H2, H2, we should get 3. If we provide it again, we should get, wow, 6. I was unexpected because I'm using the wrong application. <laughs> we get four. So um, we we actually what we're doing the the all of the um, all the rest of this stuff is actually just getting from the partial application representation of counting to a value, um, and that's that's what church numerals are. So what we're what we're trying to do is to represent counting as the successive application of functions, which happens to map really, really well to this Hwas stuff, because an instance of an, an expression in Hwas is a partially applied function that goes from some uh, um, evaluation of it, be it in Haskell, JavaScript, Python, whatever, um, to uh, the source code to that language. So you're, you're, you're providing, you're providing a, an a, an evaluator, you're providing some sort of um, interpreter that can take your un unapplied functions and turn it into some result value. So um, there's there's kind of a nice mapping between uh, church numerals and this was stuff, I think. What's the type of dollar less than? Dollar less than is apply, so um, it looks like that. But important is that, whoa. Um, 
the important thing is that it is uh, left associative where this guy is right associative. But they are the same. Anyway, that's all I got, because now you've seen all the, all the rest of the stuff. And um, yeah. What are things that are um, uh, everything in this slide. Well, the, the question was what things have been made in this? Um, uh, everything starting at the top of the scroll bar to the bottom of the scroll bar has been written in this. What should I be excited about making with it? Um, uh, so the, the, from, a, from a practical standpoint, since I have an interest in, in software security and, and uh, building interesting systems that are relatively safe, um, I, I am fascinated by uh, providing a, an unconstrained subset of Haskell that people can write in a website and then have whatever, com whatever programs they want to write just kind of, here they are, go. Um, from a, from a, uh, a messing around with languages standpoint, um, the, this, is a, this is a basic but functionally complete language for expression of ideas. So this is a complete programming language that we've kind of stepped through um, that's like, it's piggybacking off of a bigger language, but I don't think that's cheating that much. I mean, we're, we're getting a lot of functionality out of this and we are exposing a completely different set of things. The fact that I wanted to expose bool, int, string, whatever into this language, um, we could have very easily just written our own bool types. We could have written our own uh, equality testing. We could have written whatever we wanted and then provided, I mean, this, this is a launching off point for um, a, a multi-targeted compilation system, if you want. I mean, provide the instances of whatever targets you want. You've got, um, you've got one of those really nifty cross-compilers. Um, my, my, uh, my goal for the future for this type of thing is to actually attempt to read and understand um, uh, languages that were written, um, so potentially by hand, potentially by a system like this. So to parse a language and express it either in, in GADTs or, or in this HWAS thing, um, and then be able to uh, run analysis on it and either produce um, uh, I mean, the, the simplest form of it would, to, would be to produce a, like a pretty printer, something that would actually output well-formed code. Um, a more complicated thing would be to, something that would do type inference on untyped languages, for instance. And we've, got a, we've got a thing for taking a typed expression in Haskell and outputting JavaScript. Um, there's, there's a lot of research going into the other way around. As the world moves generally more towards, I mean, we've got a we've got a packed room here, full of people that are interested in, like, well, you know, reason, packed for Haskell, I mean, come, come on, so, <laughs> right? That we it's it's getting more popular. Like we're we're talking about like big companies adopting Haskell for real work. Um, so the the world is is getting more typed, more functional. Just kind of, you just have to look. So um, stuff like this is is kind of in some way on not necessarily the bleeding edge, but, but closer to the edge than not at the edge. I mean, this is, this is kind of pushing the limits of what we know how to do as programmers. And so if you used these ideas to do your first example, you said you want to make a language for someone else, mm -hmm. but you want to only expose the parts of Haskell that they need, then uh, would they be writing it in this complicated lambda syntax? Would they would they see all that? Complicated lambda syntax. Every, all, complicated. all languages are complicated. <laughs> um, you, there's definitely ways that you can clean up the, the syntax. Um, there's definitely ways that you can uh, that, that you can make um, to make this easier for for beginners to start with. But um, uh, yeah, at least right now, I mean, I I didn't I I didn't optimize for that. I optimized for Teachability, not not readability or writability. You can parse it. You can parse something simple. Put those like Python yeah. into this. Make a structure that I report. Yeah. So um, the the question was, um, uh, will will uh, intro to CS students actually write in this crazy language that we just wrote? Uh, the answer is probably no. But there are parsers, and we can write something that will generate this type of structure, um, and then run it through a compiler, and then sure enough. It'll either work or not. 
This reminds me a lot of template Haskell too, and all, all the applications of. Uh, yeah. Am I saying the right thing? I don't know. It's it's possible. I mean, like I'm I I'm I'm honored. <laughs> well, I don't know that much about Tesla Haskell, but the sure. idea is basically you write a program to generate a, a Haskell AST. Yeah. And so this is a Haskell program that generates a OS AST. Yeah. And then you can, uh, the, the idea behind the template Haskell is that it only has one consumer, which is then the Haskell compiler. But, uh, you know, you could, this is even a little more flexible because you can either have the ability to evaluate it. Yep. Or you could pretty print it or you could analyze it, et cetera. So you can, you can, Write programs to create programs. Um, in so in that in that way, yeah, this is this is, this is sort of similar to template Haskell. Um, the 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 thing that was um, kind of most most uh, uh, like a, a big driving force for me in this um, in this uh, the pursuit of this goal was to um, to have a toy to play around with the, the design decisions that they made in Haskell. Um, so as, as a language, analyzing the language that this is written in, um, designing a language in the language that this is written in to be evaluated in the language that the language was written in, um, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, you, you, get, you get a lot of um, like, oh, that's, maybe that's why, that's why we've got these, these abstractions. That's, that's, why, that's why the syntax works like this. That's why it's, it's right associated versus left associated when you do this thing. Like there's, there's little kind of subtle things creep out and you're like, oh, yeah, now I understand Haskell more. Like that, that, was, that was big for me. So, yeah. Like a lot of people write, just write a list from scratch in some random language. But sure. in Haskell, it's like a big enough language that's challenging to do from scratch. But if you can cheat, and get like a free equality, yeah. And then like you know, do the interesting stuff, and then go back and like actually do the equality thing. Sure. Later. Yeah. You can kind of work your way out and build more and more of it in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, Haskell. Haskell is a, a complex language. We get a lot of tools for free, and uh, it's it's fun to try and try and build something that's even even uh, somewhat close to what. You can express in Haskell. I mean, we can we can express a fair amount in in this, but we don't have uh, we don't have functors yet. We don't have monads. It is a it is a monad. Is that my question? Yeah. Oh, or or Ben has a question. Well, I was going to say I'm interested to think about what an optimizer might look like. Mm. So uh, it'd be a thing of a type OS AST to OS AST. So the, the question is, um, what would an optimizer look in this look like in this thing? Um, Zipper. Very well, tricky, actually. Yeah, <laughs> because kind of implicit in this is, I mean, even under the implicit types is the implicit semantic of Haskell that you can do partial application, right? Which is not true of most of most languages, really. Um, and so the obvious optimization of making something like JavaScript or any other language is to collapse all those lambdas down to a multi algebra function, but you don't know, you lose partial application at that point. Brian Monsdorf has a library that adds partial application to JavaScript, and it actually works. You don't have to write the buts, all the little parentheses. Right, parentheses. right. You can just well, write JavaScript the has bind, but and maybe it uses that or a different method. Uh, so I think it's um, using decorators, it's sort of decorator type okay. of thing. I don't know. But that, that struck me as a challenge for optimization. Definitely, um, the, the 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 challenge for uh, even doing something as as uh, per perceptibly simple as collapsing um, uh, list, um, yeah, the, the cons, um, uh, because I mean you've got you've got list literals in, in uh, languages that have lists, right? In for most cases. Um, but uh, as it turns out, even that is, I mean, you have to know about, you're passing the current state of the world into the next, into this, the, the lower functions. So you're, you're actually, what you get out of the resultant um, uh, evaluation is a, a new thing that fits the same types, <coughs> but knows more about, about itself. So you, you can, um, in, in a way, you can, you can try to like, if, oh, I found a cons. Um, I'll pass the 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 prefix that I know about so far. I mean, you look at the if we look at the um, pretty JS for uh, hcons. Oh, that's not right, is it? Uh, is it pretty JS? Uh, yeah, yeah pretty JS. 
Um, so h cons uh, for pure h pure one, uh, h cons for h pure two, h nil. Um, so if we look at that, not again. Uh, come on, guys. I'm hoping that that, no, I didn't actually. All right, fine. Parenthesize that. Don't, oops, that's not even a thing. That didn't work either. Oh, curses. Curse you types. Um, and sure enough, is there? Yeah, I did. I totally did. Um, from h pure in h cons because h pure here, h cons, h cons, h nil. Let's reduce complexity. Um, okay. Well, then screw it. Let's just h cons, uh, h nil rather, uh, by itself. Yeah, cool. And then h, uh, oh no, it's, it's triple. So h nil uh, with h nil. So this is how I did uh, array concatenation um, in, in, uh, in JavaScript. But um, because cons in JavaScript is not an expression that results in a value, I had to actually cons, like I can actually do, um, so cons for uh, bool would be h cons uh, h pure bool, or false rather, uh, against h nil. Uh, and so you end up with that as the expression of cons. Um, it's kind of nasty as things go. Um, and, and it will always end with this. So if I could kind of accumulate going forward into the, into the optimizer, if I could accumulate all the h cons that I found that are, that are next to each other, um, even for values, even like, um, so like ternary booleans or something like that that evaluates into something that, that would fit into an array, that can be a cell in the, in the, in the list. So I just keep passing those forward, passing those forward, um, until I get to something that, that's like uh, an unevaluated something or something that, that can't be treated like a, a, like a list. Um, and that would then be concatenated with the result of something else. So I mean, there's, there's definitely room for that. It's just, that's a tricky, a tricky question to solve. Tricky question to answer. Yeah. It's, weird. it's very weird. Or even yeah, creating like a thing. Build a, didn't you like build a state monad to keep <laughs> around? No, but I just do things like, like um, you have this value, you want to put this in here, but putting that in there doesn't even place and doesn't return the thing. So I would construct a new thing based on the things and return that from a lambda, but pass in nothing to the lambda that would for a nil value just to get out that value because that was something I could return. Weird things like that, just so I could have a function that could be changed with other things. But something that you made me think of, uh, something that you made me think of, was you're writing out uh, JavaScript. Yes. But you don't have to just write out JavaScript. You could write out, um, you know, lambda calculus expressed in JavaScript. You could write out something like, you know, like does JavaScript have lists or is it arrays? Arrays only, right? You could well, use like a Chris Oka, it's not what is it? Oka Oka Saki. Uh, you could do like a functional data structure implementation like, that it kicks out in JavaScript. So it would actually be a list, mm -hmm. but it would be a functional list. It would be done through functions. Mm -hmm. So take this and like the output is this, but it got Oh, I see. Right, right, right. Can um, SSCP that's your way like with no, yeah. no data, it's all functions all the way. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> I, uh... You get immutability, too. That's true. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, ask for everybody to, to clap for me so that we can stop the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah. is in our language the function from A to A. Um, turns out we can actually apply that value to itself and get the same type back. So we can actually see immediately we have um, we have higher order fun well, higher order functions in our language. Um, piggybacked on top of Haskell, uh, and then additionally just because of the way that uh, Haskell thinks about values. Um, so uh, function application, this is one also lifted from Phil Freeman. These these are the two that are that are from him. So um, mad props to uh, to Phil. Um, and uh, so we've got this, this application. So given an A in our language, so this, this entire signature is in our language. So given an A and a function from A to B, give me a B. Um, so we can bind the value A, um, and then we can lift, uh, we can lift the, um, uh, the result of this thing. So we can actually, we can bind A here and we can return a function that does the application. So return a function that takes the function and returns the application. So um, that's uh, actually the implementation of this. So uh, the only, I mean, it looks exactly like normal Haskell syntax other than um, these, these lambs in there and the, the double dollar for application. Um, const as well, uh, give me an A, give me a B, I'll give you the same A back. Um, so basically, just eat the second application, the second parameter passed in. Um, uh, all of the all of the functions that we're going to be defining are actually going to be in line. Um, and the first instance of this, or the first implementation of this language, actually generates Haskell source code. So you can actually see the um, you can see what uh, gets compiled, and and the names are all kind of sequentially generated. So so it names itself. Um, yeah, basically, yeah. So it, it does actually. There's, there's. Um, I mean, well, I'll, I'll show you in, in like two minutes. Um, so, uh, so the, the in the simply type lambda calculus, we, as I as I mentioned, is we we don't have all these types yet. We just have the concept of of data transformations. Um, so we've got um, the identity function prefixed with H. Um, so we've got, in our language, we've got a function from A to A. Um, and the way that we're going des to describe this in, in our HWAS implementation is by saying lambda. So we're going to pass in the, the, the lambda here. And the lambda definition is from x, give me x. Um, this is a normal Haskell function. Um, by, by lifting it into this lambda, um, by, by passing it into this lambda function wrapper, um, we actually lift it into our HWAS language. Um, uh, because this is now a value, the result of this lambda expression application is a value in our language, the value. Um, so the, the core of what we have uh, in this language, and this is, this is directly lifted from Phil Freeman's talk, um, is uh, we've got application, uh, right biased application, left biased application, and lambda. Um, so we, yeah, with, a, with an application, one of the application in instances takes a, um, a function in our type class, uh, uh, higher order abstract syntax, HWAS. Um, so if we've got an F, an instance of this type class, and a function in that instance of a type class, a value in that type class, we can produce another value in that type class. Um, so um, similarly, you can wrap a, uh, a Haskell function um, into, you can kind of lift this Haskell function into uh, a HWAS function. Um, uh, and you'll, you'll see that in a minute. So uh, actually, Question pretty much immediately. Yes, sir? On that lamb, I think of it as lambda, and then the left side, is, is that? The name of the function right there is, is that. So um, the question is: um, uh, Is the left-hand side the name of the function? Um, it's so this this uh, expression does not currently have um, user-definable names. Um, as you'll see, it, it does support value binding, um, but it, it kind of it piggybacks on top of uh, on top of Haskell's bindings. Um, so that. Um, this, uh, this file that I'm walking through is literate Haskell. Um, so this file itself is runnable. Um, the, the repository um, 
is, I mean, it's kind of small at the top of the screen, but um, the uh, repository is here if you want it. Um, uh, so, um, anyway, that um, <clears throat> the the file itself is runnable, um, and uh, I encourage you to download it and, and check it out. Uh, try try to run the uh, the examples. It is fairly well documented, and if there is something that is questionable, uh, issues and pull requests are welcome. So, let me give you another couple of seconds to write that down. Cool. Sounds good. Um, so, you ready? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, uh, as, so the, the simply typed lambda calculus is the concept of, uh, or is kind of the fundamentals of um, what it means to have a language that can represent computing. Um, so being able to, des to describe uh, functions, being able to describe um, the, the interactions between types, even if you actually don't know what the types are yet. We don't have, like we've got these, these kind of meta things, these holes for types to go, but we don't have the types yet. Um, so, hi, my name is Devin Stewart. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to be kind of extending uh, Phil Freeman's talk um, on uh, higher order abstract syntax in Haskell, basically uh, describing and building um, a, a subset of a language based on the simply typed lambda calculus. Um, uh, the, the reason that I wanted to give this talk was because I didn't understand Phil's talk. Um, and this actually ended up being a really nice introduction to actually kind of the fundamentals of, compu of computing. Um, so uh, if you do have any questions, this is uh, as to, to echo Jake, um, please do ask them because this is intended to be uh, kind of at the pace that I discovered things in this. So um, please do ask questions. Um, so uh, the goals, uh, I, so I explore the simply typed lambda calculus as we just said. Um, so writing programs in an embedded language in Haskell. Um, so we're, we're going to see this, um, but we're, we're keep an eye out for the distinction between um, like at, at what point you, you recognize the language kind of deviating from uh, the host language, the host language being Haskell. Because um, that's that's kind of a big moment. Um, so, uh, and also one other note is.